I'm Mark Parcell, a mine safety consultant. Like everyone, I was horrified to hear of the Pike River mine explosion in New Zealand in 2010. My deeper sympathies are with the families and loved ones of our 29 lost miners. I've never been to Pike River, I've never provided advice to the Pike River coal mine, and I'm not claiming to be any kind of expert about Pike River. But what I do know is that we can't afford not to learn the lessons from what happened at Pike River. I hope you understand that too. The aim of this program is to communicate the findings of the Pike River Royal Commission. Those findings are detailed in the Commission's report. One of the chapters of that report is titled, A Failure to Learn. It details a long history of New Zealand mining disasters, all of which were followed by some official inquiry and sadly, another disaster. Pike River is now the last line on that terrible list. Sadly, these lists are present in all mining jurisdictions around the world. The Pike River mine explosion was a tragedy, but a further tragedy will occur if we let the same thing happen again and do not learn the lessons of Pike River. There are a range of important stakeholders in any mining or business enterprise. These include the government who make the laws, the inspectorate who are charged with enforcing them, the companies who operate the mines and site management who manage them, the supervisors who supervise the operation, the workers who work in the mine and the contractors who provide services to the mine. I hope that you can see your role in this process and I hope that you can learn the lessons from Pike and have a better understanding of your role in preventing unwanted events in your mine or your workplace. This is Pike River, a failure to learn. It's a signed deal. That's a great Christmas present for the West Coast. After about eight years of planning and now three years of construction and two years of tunnelling, uh, today we've hit coal. Go, well done, Pete. There you go, mate. Thank you. <laughs> I'd imagine there'll be a few uh, quiet ales and a, a few glasses of champagne to celebrate tonight. This is a major milestone for the West Coast. The Grey District's always been a coal district and we love that name, coal. Peter Whittle phoned me up. He said, Tony, Good news, after two years, we're about to strike coal. He was excited, I was excited, everyone around the West Coast was excited. We took a TV crew with us. You can tell by the interview, we were very, very excited indeed. And uh, see so you got the product there. Yes, yeah, a nice lump of uh, Pike River coal. So uh, it's a good quality hard coke and coal for the uh, steel market. And uh, this is the first lump that we've been able to get away from the face. We've taken the block of coal, I think, from somewhere else off the face of the mine from the escarpment, I think, because when we got down there, there was no sign of coal. We'll, uh, we'll achieve about 200,000 tonnes of coal between now and the middle of next year, and we'll start exporting in probably the second quarter of uh, 2009. The optimism was always there from management, but then they'd have to be optimistic. On top of the fact that these people had invested in that coal mine, they were going back to them time and time again because they kept running out of money. So the whole thing at this point was a pressure pot. It's a simple cash flow matter. We, as coasters, thought that Peter Whittle had it totally under control because to not have it under control and to risk that entire operation and $300 million worth of coal mine, you would have been mad. It brought the promise of economic prosperity to New Zealand's west coast. But on the 19th of November 2010, 29 men died in the Pike River coal mine. After almost two years of investigation, in October 2012, a Royal Commission into the tragedy released its report. Among its conclusions, the Commission found that in a culture that put production before safety, health and safety management was not taken seriously enough at Pike River. The Commission also noted that many of its final recommendations were very similar to recommendations made by past inquiries into other mining tragedies in New Zealand and Australia. If those recommendations had been implemented, it's possible that many miners' lives could have been saved. On the 19th of November 2010, there was 31 people underground 
at 3.45, power was lost at the mine. That was the first management realised that something was wrong. Hello, ABM or road header? Hey, Dan, what was that you were looking for? Oh, just after the ABM and road header. Hello, Sparkies. Hello, anyone underground? It appears following our investigation, uh, a large methane explosion occurred. Two people managed to escape uh, serendipitously because one guy was late for work. He was going into the mine and the second chap was going out of the mine to pick up materials. The rest of the people at the mine were engaged in, the, in a variety of tasks. There were maintenance people there building various structures. There were people in the hydro mining panel and there was people in some of the production areas. 14 of the 29 people were contractors and some of those worked for local builders in Greymouth. So they had very limited mining experience. Now the two people that escaped from the mine didn't come out of the mine until after five o'clock. So it took them the best part of an hour to resuscitate themselves, if you like, and then walk out of the mine. It's about a two kilometre walk they had to do. The Pike River mine is located uh, 40 kilometres north of Greymouth on the South Island of New Zealand. It's a coking coal mine. Uh, it's only a small operation compared by Australian standards. And the technology that's used is hydro mining. And by that I mean water monitors, high pressure water monitors are used to break the coal up and flush the coal out of the mine. Hydro mining has not been used extensively in Australia. It has been used in Japan and to a lesser extent in Canada, but it is not a popular or a, a well-used mining technique. Ventilation systems in underground mines are controlled by stoppings which segregate the various roadways and allow air to flow around the mine. On October 30, less than three weeks before the explosion, a roof fall in the mine knocked over a stopping. The damaged stopping was later replaced, but in the same poor condition as it had been in previously. The Commission heard evidence that there was a plan in place to rebuild stoppings at Pike River. But by the time the mine exploded on November 19, almost none of that work had been done. Ventilation control devices, such as stoppings, were the subject of a recommendation by the inquiry into the Maurer No. 2 disaster in Queensland in 1994, in which 11 miners were killed. That inquiry recommended that minimum standards be set for the design, installation and maintenance of seals. Regarding the earlier roof fall incident at Pike River, the Commission found no evidence of investigation or report. It did find that the incident was signed off as closed on November 19, the day of the explosion. We think that was a precursor of what happened, actually happened on the day. The most likely scenario, because it can't be definitive, was the, the gulf in the hydro panel collapsed. It ejected roughly 6,000 cubic metres of methane into the mine ventilation system, which then fell over. So the intake and the returns became connected. The whole mine filled full of methane. And somewhere in that area, there was a source of ignition. It could have been the main fan. It could have been an electrical issue to do with uh, variable speed drives or poor earthing at the mine. It could have been a whole raft of possible ignition sources. There was problems with the vehicles. They may not have been electrically safe either, so we didn't definitively say what the source of ignition was, but obviously there was a source of ignition. And we also said that the explosion was not a detonation, it was a, a, a sort of a weak explosion that would have propagated through the whole mine. The preparations that a mine needs to make is to make sure the ventilation system is robust enough to stand a roof collapse and the subsequent pressure wave and methane gas emission. The ventilation system at Pie River was unusual and, and some witnesses um, said it was unique in that the main mine fan was actually located underground in the mine. 
Now, I'm not aware of anywhere else in the world that the main fan at a coal mine is located inside the mine. Normally, they're on the surface. But because of their topography around Greymouth and the Paparoa Ranges, which is where this mine is located, it's difficult. It was difficult to put a main fan up on top of the, on top of the mountain. So they didn't. They put it inside the mine. Several people expressed concern about the location of the main fan being underground. Uh, people ranging from contractors or consultants that have been brought to the mine to mine personnel. In addition to concerns about the location of the main fan, the Commission heard that the mine's ventilation management plan relied on non-existent controls and was largely ignored. The Maurer No. 2 inquiry recommended that a position of ventilation officer be established as a statutory position at all underground coal mines. Pike River did not have a ventilation officer, despite its own ventilation management plan stating that one was required. One of the issues with Pike, there, there was a fairly uh, large turnover of staff. There was six or arguably seven managers in the last two years of its operation. So corporate memory was not there in any great amount. And as well as that, a lot of experienced miners went there, didn't like what they saw, and voted with their feet. They had a Japanese expert there, arguably one of the best um, hydro mining people in the world. He told the commission that he left because he was too frightened to go underground at the mine because of the amount of gas that was coming out of the coal. So he tried to stop them cutting coal with the, hydro, with the hydro panel. But the company had initiated a bonus, quite a large sum of money to get a production target by a particular date. So people were keen to get the money. There was evidence provided to the commission by a senior mining official from the adjacent mine who basically stated that, that their production targets were unrealistic and they'd never achieved anything like that number at the mine next door. Now, the mine next door had done a lot of exploration. They had drilled up hundreds of boreholes into the deposit to understand the geology of the deposit. Pike River had drilled very few boreholes. So they found there was stone where they thought there was coal. They found the coal wasn't as thick as they thought it would be. They found the coal was gassier than they thought it would be. So the surprises were all on the negative side of the ledger. When the explosion occurred at 3.45, mine management decided to send someone into the mine to see what was going on. They sent an electrician who unfortunately didn't take his self-rescue with him and had the wrong sort of gas monitor. And he almost became victim 30 because he was overcome by fumes and the mine had to turn around and drive back out of the mine. And the only reason he got out really was because the mine was downhill and the vehicle rolled for a while until he got the engine going again. He came back out about 4.30, well, a little bit after 4.30. He, he found a body. He saw a body lying in the stone drive about two kilometres in. He assumed the person was dead. He turned the vehicle around and came back out. The person, in fact, wasn't dead. He was unconscious. And he was removed from the mine by the other chap who was walking out of the mine. He picked that guy up and basically helped him out. Mr Rockhouse was the guy who was furthest in by the mine. He um, was overcome. He didn't point on his self-rescue probably, uh, which points to the fact that they weren't probably trained on how to use it, and the other, the other person had the same issue. Both were overcome by carbon monoxide, which is a gas that's generated in, in fires and explosions. As I mentioned before, the ventilation reversed, as that often happens in a mine situation. Fresh air was pulled up the 2.3 kilometre stone drive and flushed over the top of these guys and resuscitated them. Mr Rockhouse was in better shape than Mr Smith, and as he walked out of the mine, he found Mr Smith and carried him out. Now he made a phone call when he was on his way out of the mine. He rang control and at first he got an answering machine, which is fairly unusual for a control room phone. He finally got on to somebody, he told them he was walking out with Mr Smith and he'd be at the portal sometime after five o'clock. When he got there, there was no one there. No one had they'd forgotten that they were coming out and there was no one there to meet them. So Mr Rockhouse made another phone call at the portal to tell the control room he was indeed at the outside of the mine and to come and get him.
Despite initial concerns at 3.45 when power was lost at the mine, it would be another 41 minutes before emergency services were called. It would be 16 hours before mine management determined exactly how many men were underground. The Commission later concluded that the mine manager was unfamiliar with the principles and details of the company's emergency response management plan. After Mara No. 2, it was recommended that emergency procedures be exercised at all mines a minimum of once a year. After an explosion occurs at a mine or at any sort of emergency, there should be an emergency management plan kick in. The plan at Pike was not initiated particularly well. There had never been an exercise to try it out, which was another, another issue about emergency plans. They need to be tested. And the evidence that was presented to, to the Commission indicated that that plan had not been tested for at least 12 months. Every mine has to be prepared for an emergency. Uh, and, as, and as rare and as infrequent as these disasters are, you have to be prepared. And all of the things that we've learned, and for example, that includes the ability to seal the mine. And at Pike River, without the ability to seal the mine after the first explosion, subsequent explosions occurred until the mine was basically on fire. Being prepared and having the appropriate emergency provisions in place can mitigate the potential consequences uh, when those events do occur. With that sort of explosion, with that volume of gas, in a small mine like Pike, and bear in mind that the whole volume of the mine was only 160,000 cubic metres, including the stone drives as well. So it's pretty easy to fill it up with gas, and there was never going to be any survivors out there. The only people saying that the people were down the mine, breathing on compressed air lines and everything else, were people with the best of intentions, they wanted their mates to survive. But, that, but the people there that knew about mining, the New South Wales Mind Rescue people, the Queensland Mind Rescue people, the New Zealand Mind Rescue people, were all saying the only two people that got out were the two people that got out and no one else was coming out. Statements made in the period following the explosion raised expectations that the miners might be rescued. When it became apparent the men had died, the emotions of already devastated families spilled over into frustration and anger. The Commission found the management of communications a matter of concern, saying it affected the family's ability to cope with the loss of their loved ones. So a few of us came here I remember a group of us, we held hands and prayed. I got a text during the day to say there'd been a significant event, I think were the words or something along those lines that had happened. And mum was sitting outside with um, a few of her workmates having a um, cup of tea and I read her the text, I said, I wonder what it means. And you know, significant events, good. <laughs> We went along to this meeting full of hope and everyone felt like that. The police liaison person that we had with us came up and said, I think this is good news. They got up and they started speaking and Peter Whittle told us how the rescue team was kitted up and ready to go in. People were starting to cheer and clap and, and then, then they dropped this bombshell that there'd been this second explosion and that there was no chance that anyone be alive and ugh. well that hall just erupted it was it was it for me I just remember people screaming and wailing and I just had my hands and my head lifted back and just couldn't believe what was what was being said and I realised then that Michael wasn't going to come home alive. There was so much shame.
shouting and crying and disbelief. It was... I'll never forget it. Just, oh, people were just, just going through hell as it was, and then, and then to have that bombshell dropped on you and the way it was done was, yeah, I mean, you'd almost call it inhumane the way it was done. Yeah, I'll never forget the noise and and the. in the hall that day. Coal mines have a habit of re-exploding after the first explosion. And it's all very well to say there's a window of opportunity, but you only know that window after the second explosion occurred. And if you look at history, we've had coal mines re-explode after five minutes, after five hours. Mara number two exploded after two days. There was one in Russia in Siberia where an explosion occurred just a few hours after the first explosion and 17 mines rescue guys died. So there is no window of opportunity. It was not safe to re-enter that mine. These subsequent explosions can also be extremely dangerous for rescue teams working outside the mine. Five days after the first explosion at Pike River, three men were working on top of the mountain near the slimline ventilation shaft. They were waiting for a chopper to pick them up when the mine exploded for a second time. The men heard the roar and took off, scrambling down the mountainside. As they ran for their lives, a huge plume of smoke, dust and debris blasted out of the shaft, smashing some of their equipment. Very fortunately, the men escaped unharmed. The first explosion occurred at 3.45 on the Friday. The second explosion occurred on the, w the following Wednesday. And after that explosion, people weren't talking about rescuing anybody, they realised that everyone, finally realised everyone was unfortunately dead. Help was sought from all over the world. They had American people involved as well. New Zealand Mines Rescue, Queensland, New South Wales, experts all over the place. But the bottom line was the mine was very poorly instrumented in terms of providing gas data. And if you don't have the gas data, you can't do much at all. So until we put in more boreholes, until we got some more gas monitoring, we didn't know what was going on. After the second explosion occurred on the Wednesday, there was another couple of explosions and the ventilation shaft um, caught fire. There was a flame coming out of the shaft. That's a very, very difficult thing to control, especially in, the, in mountainous topography like we've got in New Zealand. We finally managed to get the fire out and we sealed the place up. We put a, a steel cap on top of the ventilation shaft and we concreted that. We concreted every other crack and hole we could find around the mountainside to, to stop it and put the fire out. And if we hadn't done that, it would have kept burning because they had a limitless supply of fuel there. The coal would have kept generating methane, there would have been more explosions, it would have been ongoing. The Mara No. 2 inquiry recommended that all mines should make provision for rapid sealing to facilitate re-entry by rescue teams in the event of an emergency. I've been involved with coal mine fires for quite a long time and Pike River would be the worst I've ever seen in terms of lack of preparation for a problem, in terms of uh, any anticipatory work, in terms of the training of the people, in terms of the technology and equipment available on site to do anything. When our Simtars people got there, there was no gas monitoring working at all. Somebody was lowering a tube down the fan and pumping gas out with a stomach pump out of an ambulance. There was zero capacity or capability to do anything. The, monitoring, the gas monitoring system was not functional when we investigated that further. Some hadn't been working for months. There was no basically functioning gas monitoring equipment on any of the returns coming out of the mine. Now, in a Queensland mine, we'd have six, seven, eight, ten monitors there. They had nothing. In the six or eight weeks before the explosion, there were 69 times when the alarm bell should have rung for the mine management there. The gas levels were above acceptable limits. Um, 21 times out of those 69, they were over the explosive limit. And there was people in the mine. And nothing was done. Workers at the mine reported supervisors allowing them to work in explosive atmospheres to get the job done. 
The Commission found many incidents at the mine were reported, but investigations were not completed and many notifiable incidents were not reported to the Department of Labor. The Maurer No. 2 inquiry recommended that mines be required to develop and implement protocols for noting and accepting alarm conditions raised by the gas monitoring system. The backlog of incidents and investigations at the Pike River mine was cleared in October 2010, a month before the explosion. History can teach us a lot here. Mount Lyle, which was a mine in Tasmania, had a disaster in the early 20th century. The mine manager there said, and I read it not long ago, I never expected to be a fire in the mine. And, and I heard those exact words from the mine manager of Pike River who said, I never expected to be a methane explosion here. When you're looking at responsibility to operate a mine, the board has a role in providing the atmosphere, if you like, or the, the conditions under which the mine can operate safely. The board doesn't run the mine on a day-to-day -day basis, but they do set the standards. Now, the Health and Safety Committee at the, at the board hadn't met for over 12 months before this matter occurred. So the board was taking um, a limited interest in what was going on, and the board was obviously focused on production as well. Below the board, the, the CEO was based in Wellington, and he was, he, he was taking interest in the mine. He was there quite a lot as well. But once again, the focus of the management at the mine, on, as the commission decided, was on production. Safety was an issue that wasn't handled as well as it should have been handled. Now, below that level, below the management level, you have the sort of super, the supervisory level, people like deputies. They had complained on numerous occasions. And we and the Commission had a lot of documentation of deputies' reports, talking about lack of ventilation monitoring equipment, uh, some, some quite long documents with lists of things wrong that needed to be fixed. Their management said they'd fix them, but the Commission found that at the, at the time of the explosion, the, most of the things were not fixed. The next level down is obviously the workers, and they were in two groups. There were a mining group, and then there was the contractors, most of whom were inexperienced miners. They didn't know what they didn't know, and that was the problem. They often did things that interfered with the mining operation because they didn't understand how coal mines operated. So they changed the ventilation, they moved things around, they turned fans on and off, and gassed other areas out. So there's a whole raft of things went on that should never have happened. The regulator has a very important role. They don't run the mine, the mine manager runs the mine, they're responsible for mine safety but the regulator is there to keep the mine manager to his task. What happened in New Zealand was in the 1980s, they had quite a large group looking after mines, around about 25 people. But as time progressed, they were absorbed into the, into the workplace health and safety, the, the normal inspectorate. And by the time Pike happened, there were down to two people that knew about mine, mines. And they were responsible for roughly 1,000 quarries, 40 fairly large mines, and tunnels as well. The inspector was of the opinion the mine was compliant. They were, they, they were in favour of negotiated agreements. They'd never issued any directives or any, any stop, uh, stop mining um, actions on the, on the mine. It was possible to do it, but because of the uh, lack of support the regulator had from the management system within the, in the government, they, they felt that, and I asked the question to the commission, what would have happened if you'd shut the mine down? And the inspector said to me that, um, he thought his manager would have told him to reopen it. We've had 200 instances in the last 12 months in Queensland where we've issued directives to mines here from matters that have some similarity to Pike. There were very often around people fiddling with methane monitors, people driving in the high methane atmospheres, people smoking in coal mines. The most important thing we can do is not become complacent, not become apathetic and think this will never happen here. One of the challenges you have in the industry is a default to compliance thinking. And doing a risk assessment can be complied with by putting a piece of shelfware in the office in the form of a risk assessment report and then doing nothing about it. You need to understand the risks in your mining operation. And you need to put in place principal hazard management plans that will mitigate those risks. Now, if you do that, and you follow the processes you set in place, you follow the safe operating procedures, you train the people properly, you buy the right equipment, you should be able to mine coal safely. 
Evidence provided to the Royal Commission identified a raft of serious health and safety management problems at Pike River. Management plans included provisions that were not in place at the mine. Some management plans had no relevance to Pike River. Other parts were simply not followed or ignored in practice. Some departments took little notice of action points arising from safety committee meetings. Risk assessments were ranked as being acceptable with controls that were not implemented. Actions from risk assessments were not completed. Explosion barriers were purchased but not installed. Many procedures for methane drainage were not consistently followed and the methane sensor on the underground drill rig was the subject of 25 planned work orders in the four months before the explosion. All 25 were documented as not done. In addition, despite the 111 metre vertical main ventilation shaft being deemed unsuitable as a second escapeway from the mine, and a requirement from the Department of Labour that another walk-out egress be provided, no alternate escapeway existed at the mine. In summary, the Pike River Royal Commission concluded, problems in relation to risk assessment, incident investigation, information evaluation and reporting, among other things, indicate that health and safety management was not taken seriously enough at Pike. The Department of Labor initiated prosecutions under their legislation and a methane drainage drilling company was fined $45,000 or thereabouts dollars for not maintaining equipment. The Pike River Company was fined um, some millions of dollars, basically the residual money they had left in the tin for, not, for a series of charges but not running a safe operation. The Commission uh, put out 16 recommendations. There were sort of overarching recommendations with the numerous subsections below that. And the New Zealand Government accepted all the recommendations and one of those was to bring back union check inspectors. Now they'd had them in the past, but they abolished them. Now union check inspectors, if you like, are another pair of eyes, independent to the regulator, independent to the mine, that can go around the mine and have a look and see if things are wrong. And I think they would have added value there, and the Commission thought so as well, because we recommended that they come back. Well, even before we'd released our report, the government had taken some steps to increase the size of the inspectorate and create a high hazard unit. When they received our 16 recommendations, they said they would implement all of them, and they have done so, and they've done so quite rapidly in terms of implementing legislation, because it's not a straightforward task, and they've done it very quickly. The responsible minister was transferred to another department, and a new person was put in that role. The Department of Labor could have potentially prevented these, these men losing their lives. If they had done their job better, it's possible that those men might not have died. There has been a number of Royal Commissions into mine disasters in New Zealand as well as in Australia and all over the world. And one of the, one of the tasks the Commission had to look at was to look at what the recommendations were from all these dozens of other Royal Commissions and Commissions. And what we found was the similarity in the recommendations. They were all, all with underground coal mines, they were very often around ventilation, around gas monitoring, around management, around risk analysis, risk interpretation, risk mitigation. There was very few new recommendations that we could see were going to come out of Pike. It was just going to be a repeat of the stuff that we never learned before. And the same's happened in Australia. With Mara number two, Mara number four, Kayanga, Box Flat. They all, methane at the right concentration, between five and 14% will explode. It will catch fire if there's a source of ignition. Very definite feeling these over the recent times that the industry has forgotten those lessons. We don't know when it'll happen, but there appears to be a rising case that there will be another disaster. We've done a huge amount of work. We've produced some quite dramatic improvements, but all the evidence is that today, the pendulum is swinging back. Some key recommendations of the Pike River Royal Commission include, managers in underground coal mines should be appropriately trained in health and safety. Ventilation officer should be a mandatory position with key functions, relevant qualifications, required competencies and training identified. The ventilation officer should define standards for ventilation control devices such as stoppings, 
and requirements of underground gas monitoring systems. Requirements relating to ingress and egress from the mine should be regulated. In the event of an emergency, it's fundamental that there be one incident controller, located at the incident control point, who controls the direction and coordination of the emergency response. Operators of underground coal mines should be required by legislation to have a current and comprehensive emergency management plan that is audited and tested regularly. Operators should be required to install facilities that will support emergency mine sealing and inertization. And an effective regulatory framework for underground coal mining should be established as a matter of urgency. For as long as mining has existed, tragedies like the one at Pike River have occurred. Mine safety has improved, but we continue to lose miners and mines in incidents and disasters around the world. It is possible to operate our mine safely, but that can only be done by ensuring that we learn the lessons from those disasters that have occurred. The more responsibility you have in an operation, the more responsible you are for making and keeping it safe. Learn the lessons, understand your role, and make your mind safe. When any accident occurs at a mine, there's obviously the immediate impact on uh, the workmates and, and the family. Uh, but on an occasion such as a disaster, it extends much further to the organisation, the community, the recovery workers, and then eventually the, the economy. And whilst history records that event on one day at one time, uh, for those people who are affected, it lasts a lifetime. Won't you please come home? Probably the saddest story was, was Joseph Dunbar, who was only 17, and it was his first day. And he wasn't even supposed to be there. He was due to start on the Monday. But he came in on the Friday because he was keen. And he was with the drillers. And the drill foreman said, come out with me at lunchtime, I'll drop you home. He said, no, I'll stay and go out with the guys at 4 o'clock. So Joseph Dunbar was a child. He had no knowledge of mining in any shape or form. It was his first hours in the place and he never came out. Let us it's all a waste. 29 lives, $300 million. Very badly managed. Joseph Ray Dunbar was just 17. One week ago, turned 17. No doubt had a few drinks out with his mates. He'd been through a rough patch, someone said. Who doesn't? A boy from the coast, even-eyed. But he'd gotten a job now. New boots. The making of him, someone said. You get a lot of respect with the job. He couldn't wait. Probably had his lunch packed. The unlined face, the big smile. Probably had a way with the girls the local girls couldn't wait the local girls are wearing black mothers and sons and husbands too he probably ran the last hundred yards Joseph Ray Dunbar climbed aboard and headed on down a smile and a wave and a joke amongst men the biggest day of Joseph's life You caught the train, Joseph. You took the train too soon. You caught the train before your time. There's a heart There's a silver mist on a mountain A million tears in a fountain 
Father is calling Son, come home Hold on to the time Brothers, 29. 